Hello and welcome to yet another edition of Times Exclusive on Times Television TTV. The program is also live on your radio station Times. My name is Wander Msisi. The program is brought to you KTC of Rainbow Pens. Wow, I think Capish looks amazing on the door. Mm, the electric blue cuts it for me. Come on, look at the tango, candy pink, mm -hmm. bent orange, okay, sweet line. Do you like what you see? You can dream it and live it. Download your Rainbow app today and begin the magic of transforming your home into a fabulous space. Rainbow Paints. Peace of mind. Part of the deal. Welcome back. I now have the pleasure of introducing to you our guest in today's edition of the program. Does he need any introduction? I don't think so, but I will do it anyway. My guest in today's edition of the program is the Daliso Chaponda. Welcome thank to the you. program, thank you, thank Daliso. You. Good to be here. I needed to pronounce that name correctly. Yes. Daliso. Well, I'll tell you the interesting thing is yes. I actually take all pronunciations because yes it's, a lot of people get confused because the thing is i was born in zambia uh -huh. but i am malawian uh-huh in malawi it's spelled t-s-o daliso in zambia it's spelled i-s-o okay and because i was in zambia when i was born my parents chose to use the, the local uh, yes zambian pronunciation yes and so people are like did you change your name no it's just we were in zambia at the time as exiles and they spelt it that way but i will answer to anything, anything. all right it's all me <laughs> all right so by the way we are at amareri's hotel this we is are. the fourth floor of the the amareri's hotel and as you can see in the background there is water there there's a pool but you also get to see the view of Blanta city I hope our cameras can show us the view of Branta City and I have Dali Sochaponda. So Dali so you you telling me just now that you were born in Zambia yes. and that has also been a bone of contention with our neighbors because you've made it now and yes. uh, the Zambians are saying ah oh, but he's Zambian <laughs> and the Malawians are saying no but he's Malawian so yes. we kind of uh, fighting over you exactly but I mean look I'm Malawian I'm 100% be... Malawian your your nation is your blood it's your parentage no matter where you have to run away, no matter where you are brought up, wherever, wherever you are, whether you were a refugee, whether you're a migrant, you are still, home is still where your parents are from, where your culture is from. And so I'm Malawian, but I understand, I actually, I like the fact that lots of African countries claim ownership of me. <laughs> because when I'm performing jokes, I'm not performing jokes just for Malawians, I'm performing for, for all, all Africans. All right. Yeah. So just to put the record straight, our neighbors, the yes. Zambians' cousins, Zambians. that is so easy. Malawian, he's just told us that he, he chooses Malawi over any other African country. <laughs> so my yeah. brother, feel the blood. Yes. Now, I want to know a little bit more about you. Mm -hmm. Who is Dali Sochaponda before we get to talk about what you do? Well, I am a person who, the thing I think I was put on earth to do is to create. Okay. Right. And so at first I thought I'd be a novelist and then I thought I might be a journalist. I thought of all different ways of creating and then I found the one which I'm most talented at, which is comedy. Right. But it's, it's my favorite thing to do is to make, be it poetry, painting, anything. But the one which my talent was for is comedy. So are you an artist? Are you a comedian? How, yes, how would I'm, you want to be? I am an artist. I'm you an, an artist. artist. I'm a person who makes things. I write plays. I do comedy. I'm most famous for comedy, but I also make in any form. Talking about comedies and the jokes that you make, you constantly talk about a nagging girlfriend. And people are asking to say, is daddy so engaged? <laughs> what is his marital status? No, 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 no. I am currently single. Well, I've got a girlfriend. I've got a girlfriend. She's not the nagging girlfriend in the videos. That was several years ago. This one is much, much lovelier. So I've got a girlfriend, not married. 
but the plans are no no plans okay. she might be watching don't give her ideas <laughs> literally we're just happy all we're right just happy all right so i also want to understand what what inspires these jokes that you make the whole world like literally i anything that makes me feel so if something makes me angry i write about that if something makes me happy i write about that big emotion if something makes me offended i write about that so that's why i often will talk about politics i'll talk about relationships i'll talk about family because those are the things which give you big emotions talking about politics talking about family you have a father who is active in politics how has that played in your business well at first it was a big problem because i would make fun of him i'd make fun of his party because as a comedian you've got to make fun of the people in power that's where the biggest laughs are and it was always an issue he would get frustrated he'd say do you have to do this joke the crowd loved it yes right i loved it and now that he's in opposition he's like tell your jokes, tell your jokes. <laughs> i don't yes. mind anymore yes, i don't mind anymore. <laughs> but at, 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 at some point was it was it a problem no it was a problem in terms of i think it took a while for malawians to understand satire is not an attack you think now they do i think they do i think by the second or third of my shows people started to understand oh this guy he makes fun of everyone right because right. he'll make fun of his dad then he'll make fun of the people in power and again it's it's not like you're trying to create a revolution yeah you're calling you're calling attention to the absurdities yes and we laugh to make us feel better because we can't change it all right you now living in the uk yes how is it life like in the uk it's great i mean it's it's really busy i mean when i'm here i think the lifestyle do you often come to malawi i haven't been f- during the pandemic okay but now i'm coming two or three times a year oh. now that, that we can travel again yeah and the thing is like i love my lifestyle here much more you know i mean it's more beautiful the pace of life is better but in terms of just practical here i can't do as many shows as i can do in the uk in the yes. uk i do eight shows a week all right where exactly do you do your show do you all do across them? the uk and then i'll fly to europe i'll fly to america I'll fly to um asia and i'm i can do so many shows being based out of the, the uk because every city has comedy clubs has theaters yeah. malawi isn't yet there yeah it's growing it's building yeah. i mean i'm doing a show here at amaryllis i'm doing yeah. a show at BICC yeah. but that's two venues yeah. and I'm done yeah. right and we'll, we'll so we'll get to talk about those shows uh, yes, in a moment I, but I, what I wanted to find out was uh, there was a time you were hosting a BBC show yes. do you do you still do that show yes i still do this show so i think you are speaking about you're either speaking about i've got a show my own show yes. called citizen of nowhere uh-huh. right and that i do it's now going into the fourth series yeah and then i also host an international sh- new year show every year with comedians from around the world Does that pay your bills? Are you can you comfortably say that you know I'm comfortable doing I'm, what I'm, I'm doing? I'm more than comfortable. I have too much. You have, have too much. much. I do I I I literally it's not just I tour all the time. I do television shows, I do radio shows and between all of that I know that I'm living in privilege and I'm living like, you know, 10% of the people in the world. I'm very lucky. And so we knew about you before, but the climax of people now wanting to follow that is so was the time where by you were featuring on the Britain's Got Talent. Yes. That moment where you're getting the golden buzzer and all of a sudden everybody says, "Hey, our dude now is on that TV show. I want you to take me through the experience of Britain's Got Talent." So, I went on not expecting much. I okay. thought I was funny enough to get through, but I didn't yes. think I'd end up being in the top 3. Yes. I thought it would just I'd just do well enough to help my career and I can start doing slightly bigger shows. but instead it changed my life it was absolutely crazy like the day it aired i had to turn off my phone because yes. so many people were ringing yes. i was getting so many offers and everything that has happened since has been set off by that of all the judges people have always picked simon cowell as the main judge and every time you see the performance on britain is got talent american is got talent everybody's looking at simon cowell to see what comment is going to make and he gave you a standing ovation yes he loved my show and the actual thing is he's just very honest he's at that point of success where you don't have to pretend so if he hates you he hates you and yes. if he likes you he likes you so yes. he's been very supportive to me um even since i did the show 
and the judge Amanda Holden who yes. gave me the golden buzzer has yes. been very supportive. So you're part of the family now. So I still will go do shows for them yeah. and charity fundraisers for them. It's been good. Was that the turning point of your career as a comedian? It was sort of just an the next step. All right. It's that it gave me a big boost, but I'd done big shows. I'd done shows in uh, South Africa, like Stand Up Africa. I'd done a few shows in Malawi. But then Britain's Got Talent meant that I went from doing 300 seaters to doing 3,000 seaters. It made everything bigger. I went from doing a show, you know, just for people who come to the show to doing stuff which is watched all around the world. Now, with comedy, you always get those people that feel like, hmm, this joke probably is going overboard, and then there are those that are enjoying the jokes, they don't care, they're just having a laugh. There are some Malawians that have said, but daddy, so you have this opportunity that you would showcase Malawi on that international market. But sometimes you make bad jokes about Malawi. You want, how, how would you want people to know Malawi well, through your jokes? This, my job is comedian. I am not a tourist board member. I am not a, a flagship. I am not an advertisement. I aim simply to make people laugh, to make people sometimes lay down their burdens if they've had a hard day and relax, that's my job. Now, in terms of people who think you should not talk about the negative, they don't understand. You are celebrating the country even when you talk about the negatives. So at How? the same time, I will do jokes about some absurd things like corruption, yep. right? But I'll also talk about, like in my radio show, I talk about the Chilembwe uprising, right? No. I talk about the history. I talk about the exports. I talk about everything good and bad i'm looking for the laughter and you will find that i've got so many fans who now are like i want to go to malawi because i tell the whole story not just the advertisement pretend everything's good because life is hard we where, can't pretend where do you get your hard. content where do you get content particularly when you get talk about malawi you don't live in malawi quite often yes. where do you get your content about I speak malawi to my family every week i know what's going on i read the newspapers i read history uh, like when I talk about, like for example, in my last series of my radio show, I talked about when in the World War One, Malawian soldiers were made to go fight in Germany, right? That's a piece of history that I can talk about, and people who are listening in England will be like, I didn't even know that they were Malawian soldiers. Yes. So I, it's from history, it's from the news, and it's just from my own experience, my own memories. You made a joke about generous. Ah, yes. Yes. And the guys have been saying, you know, when they heard that I'm going to have an interview with Fizz, like, Wanda, man, this is an opportunity. Go get the qualification. Now, I am you not said, saying that, that it was you. Okay? I know, I know. It wasn't now, me. I am not saying that it was you. <laughs> but I want but to remind I am, you. I, I want to remind you. I have also got to say yes. that you have got to know, you are not blind, right? You know that in the country there are some journalists who have to be paid to come and cover events. You must know that they are journalists who are paid money and that influences what they write. I was not making this up out of nowhere. Literally, I have written my own review before in a newspaper. All right, so probably you're talking about one or two, but the impression that people <laughs> got was that Malawian journalists can't even write anything. They get to give you the, you say, okay, write it for me. You write for them, they just put the byline and you get even to give them money. And people are like, no, that's not me. That's not us. That was based on true experiences. And also, I'm not saying it's everybody. I'm saying this is what happened to me in Malawi, right? And the interesting thing is, one, you're joking. People don't take it seriously. They see that you're exaggerating truth, right? But you must know the truth which I'm exaggerating is the fact that there are a lot of journalists here where you pay them to show up. All right, so... Do you follow Malawian comedy? Like I, uh, I mean, I don't w follow a lot of it. First of all, I have very bad chichewa. Yeah. Also, I literally am running around all over, and I don't watch a lot of comedy because I might be influenced. I watch drama. I watch uh, depressing things. I watch things other than my life. Right. But at the same time, I'm aware of a few people like Mr. Broken English because, you know, he reached out to me. He sent me some videos. So the ones who sent me videos I've watched, but I'm not really on the ground knowing. But I'm glad that it's growing. All right. So my asking of the question is, you have a platform now. 
where you could pull a brother or two or sister and say, look, I have a platform. I can why? showcase Malawian international yes, content. Yes, my question is why? You don't think it's necessary? You are doing an interview with me. Why haven't you brought a, 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 another journalist to, to do it? Because I'm doing it with you. Exactly. So when I'm doing my show, I'm doing my shows. Right? So you, you don't think you could also use your platform no, no, to promote no. the talent about a... Malawi and just be the only Malawian on that no, top level? Again, I don't see no, no, I don't see myself as an advert. I see myself as an artist, right? I talk about the human struggle, and my number one priority is to make people laugh till they cry. Now, if there is a Malawian who rises, who is brilliant and is making people laugh till they cry, I will hire them, right? Like I have brought, when I'm doing these shows in Malawi, uh, a Kenyan, Indian, British comedian, because he makes me laugh to that point, right? So that's who I'm gonna work with. You know, like I, when I was in South Africa, I worked with Trevor Noah, not because Trevor Noah wanted to help me, because he found me funny and said, this guy will work with me. Yeah, but for him to find you funny is because uh, there was an opportunity, there was a link that linked you to him. So my question is, uh, do you think that probably people would say, because uh, we don't get to get exposed, exposure, we might have the content, but I don't have the opportunity to get exposed. That is so has got an opportunity to expose me. It's up to people now to judge whether what has been exposed is good or not. But no, no, no. What I think people must do is, if you are local Malawian, you must start making waves. In, even if it's in a village, even if it's in just a small show, you start making waves, I will hear the ripples, right? Same way I've heard about a few people, I'll hear the ripples. I knew Anne Kansime long before I met her, just from the ripples. So just start doing it, and then if I hear the ripples and I watch it and I want you to come, I will bring you because I find you funny, not because I want to support. All right, so maybe how hard has it been for you to make this breakthrough? Because, like I said, I think a lot of us started following you on Britain's Got Talent. Yeah. But we don't know the story before Britain's Got Talent. There's a thing which they say, to become an expert at anything, you need to spend 10,000 hours. I spent 10,000 hours. I was a comedian since 1999. Right? 1999. 1999, doing small comedy shows. Where? In Canada, I started right. when I was in university. So you started in Canada, basically. In Canada. The journey started I started in, in Canada. Canada while I was studying, and the side I would be doing uh, little comedy shows, and then it eventually became my job around five years later. And then again, I was just doing writing when you say every day. When you say it became your job, what do you mean? You mean when I you, say you made a living out of make it? Make a living out of it. All when right. you're paying no. your rent from it, it's your job, right? So that it was probably around 2006 that it was now what was paying for my job. I was writing jokes every day, performing every day, traveling up and down the, uh, you know, I've performed all around the world and it was just literally, I put in the time. So by the time that I became famous because of Britain's Got Talent, yes. I'd already been a comedian for a long time. I already had hours of jokes, right? And so that's why I was able to capitalize on it because it's that thing of there's no luck, there's being prepared. So when the opportunity came, I could do it. Because there are lots of people who've done Brilliance Got Talent, and then in a year, people don't know who they are. Yes. Because they don't use the moment. So I always, this is what I'm saying with is the local artists, is you, you become an expert. So if that moment comes, you can really capitalize. But how do you become an expert when people don't get to know about you? Because you, you, you've, you've said here that uh, you're in Malawi performing two shows only in Blanta and Longi because we don't even have the venues for these comedians to come out and no, people to see their talent. what you do is you've got... So like when I started, when I was in university, nobody wanted to put me on a professional show. So I used to go to open mics. Yes. Right? And I would yes. do perform for free. Yes. I would do put on shows myself for students. Yes. You just make it happen. So I'm just saying that whatever there is, if there's music, you're like, oh, there's a place where they play music. Maybe there could be comedy before that. If there's a hotel where they sometimes have guests, maybe you can perform that. It's a hustle. You've got to just really, this is the difficult thing about being an artist in Africa. You've got to be half artist, half businessman. Yes. In England, you can just be business, just be artist. Yes. Here, you've got to be, you've got to create the opportunities. Um, like, but South Africa is a, almost like a, it shows us what can be done. Because if you go to South Africa, mid-90s, there was no comedy. 
Mm-hmm. There was just white com- comedy. There was no yeah. black comedy. Yes. If you look at it now, it's got a thriving big circuit which has created Luis Ogola, Trevor Noah, all these people. So that could happen in Malawi. But the creation of Roiso and Trevor Noah, isn't it the now what people have started paying attention to, to, to South Africa, the same way now people would want to be paying attention to Malawi because you now become the brand that is presenting that country on that international market and people are saying, no. who else is coming from that country? What? No, no, it's what happened was they created an industry in their country, right? Okay. And that's what made them good. So when I went there, there were no comedy clubs. And then the next time I went there, there were two comedy clubs. Then the next time I went there, there were four comedy clubs. And as the industry grew, they became a platform where they became good. Yeah. Right? And then they became so good that they were world class. All right. But it takes practice. And so the problem is, I don't think you'll have that happen in Malawi until there are lots and lots of shows. But I mean, I've heard it's happening where we are now, Amaryllis. Yes. I believe they're going to be doing monthly shows. Yeah. On Times TV, we have open mic on Thursdays there where you go. comedians will That's come the place. and. Uh, upcoming and those wait why aren't i on this show you're going to be on that show by the way <laughs> yes um okay talking about creating the industry do you yeah. have plans to create a comedy industry in malawi just like record labels where people would sign you know musicians yes do you I think it's a business that would work um people d- now appreciating comedy i don't because what people don't realize is like i've i write for six hours a day i write comedy i write novels i perform I don't have time to do this. Now, if there's a businessman who's watching this and is inspired, they can go crazy, try and create a comedy industry in Malawi. And if they ring me, I'll come perform or support. But I'm not going to create it because it's a nine to five job. A lot of people think, oh, you must be a comedian. You make it up on the spot. No, it take to be at the level I am. You have to be your full time job. And being a comedy businessman, that's a full-time job as well. So it's not me, but someone, go for it. Talking about the novels that you keep reminding me about, have you published any of your There's novels? There's one of them which will be coming out at the end of this year. The All one right. I wrote a novel during the pandemic because there was no performance. Yeah. And that will be coming out. End What's of about? Year. So it's a book for, for children about a, a child who's a refugee who discovers she has a magical power. So it's sort of sort like of Harry fiction? Potter fiction. All right. You're watching Times or exclusive on Times Television, TTV, but you're also listening to the program on Times Radio. My guest in today's edition of the program is Daliso Chaponda, the artist. We like to know him as a comedian, but he is the artist. And the program is coming to you from Amaredis Hotel, floor number four. And the program is brought to you courtesy of uh, Rainbow Pants. Wow, I think Kate looks amazing on the door. Mm, the electric blue can it for me. Come on. Look at the tango. Candy pink. Mm-hmm. Bent orange. Okay, sweet line. Do you like what you see? You can dream it and live it. Download your Rainbow app today and begin the magic of transforming your home into a fabulous space. Rainbow paints. Peace of mind. Part of the deal. Welcome back. You're watching Times Exclusive on Times Television, TTV. You're also listening to the program on Times Radio. My guest in today's edition of the program is uh, Daliso Chaponda, the artist. Welcome back, Daliso. Good to be back. We're talking about comedy industry in Malawi, and uh, you know, you're saying that you can't create the industry because you're busy doing what you're. Also, uh, I forgot to mention, I also don't live here. <laughs> right. Yeah, you don't have so, to live here. You no, can create. If I ever moved back here, right? Would you ever move back? It's, well, a, it's a question that yes. I also wanted to no, ask. No, no. So Do you plan to come back? It's very based on opportunities. So I'm trying to make a plan to have a show on DSTV. Okay. Right. And if I can film it in Malawi, not in South Africa, then I would move back. But I would, I wouldn't move back with no work. I'd move if there's a work opportunity that works out of here but when you get to that level you're able to create your own opportunities isn't that correct i think that's that's almost naive in that you can't you can't just literally 
uh, I can't just go to Mnet or BBC and say this is going to happen. Like even my BBC show, I had to pitch it and I had to write it and I had to have like many meetings to make it happen. So I'm always working on projects, but some of them they say no, even at my level, at every level, even at Chris Rock's level, they still get told, told no. So you just keep doing it. So at some time I may do like a DSTV show, but maybe not. It depends who else is pitching at that time. Okay, but my thinking is probably you, you told me that you've made more than enough. So is it not time to invest no, I invest. in the industry that you're no, no, passionate I about? I invest, but the thing is this, is that when I say I've made enough, it's that I live well. I'm not saying that I'm a multimillionaire with Bentleys and stuff <laughs> like that. If I stop working, right, during the pandemic when I wasn't able to work for two years, the savings went from big... <laughs> Do nothing, a knock right? on it. So I have to keep working to maintain my lifestyle. I've not made so much. I'm not Sata. I don't have extra money to be <laughs> investing into you seven different this. people. You've right? started this. You've started this. <laughs> <laughs> no, but no. that's my point is if I get to that point that I have excess, right, then there's a different proposition. But right now I am living to maintain my level, right? And I've got plans to go to the next level, but we'll see what happens. Jokes. When you make a joke, I've asked this question and I want to ask it in a different way. When you make a joke that somebody is not comfortable with, yeah. do they even give you feedback? And what do you do? do you Sometimes they do, but that's their problem. Like, art is not meant to be easy, right? Like, you can watch something, it can make you laugh, but you can watch a horror movie, it can make you scared. You can watch a sad movie, it can make you cry. So as long as I get a response from you, I'm doing my job. So sometimes people will come to me after the show and they'll say, ah, that joke, it offended me. I'll yeah. say, good. I, you, you think it's good? I say, it's good. It, it got a response out of you. <laughs> Any response other than I'm bored is good for me. Right? All right. Because you're engaging. So your, your job is to make sure people are entertained and not entertained, bored. Entertained, engaged. Engaged, right? Entertained is almost misleading because engaged can even be angry. How, how do you get people engaged? Is I talk about things which are important. I talk about things which I'm passionate about, which they're passionate about. Now, some jokes, you are laughing, and he's angry. And then another joke, he's laughing, and you're angry. As long as you're engaged for the whole time, I'm doing my job. But I'm not saying that you're going to, for my entire show, be laughing the whole way. I may bring up a subject which makes you uncomfortable. I may bring up a subject which makes you question your own behavior, right? Because I talk about stuff, I talk about hypocrisy, and we're all hypocrites. Finals of Britain is gold talent. Your family is there, and the Camillas would move from you to your dad. I don't know who else was there, but I, th I, I my, think your my family. My dad, my mom, and my brother yeah. were there. And that was the time your dad was entangled in some issues. He got cleared, by the way. Yes, I want to did. put it on record. But you, you also talked about the issues that he was answering then, and people were like, uh, no, no, the, If it's happening, I talk about it. If it's life, I talk about it. There's no reality where there's nothing I don't talk about. Because that's what people are thinking about. That's what people are interested in. And I think it's like, if I am performing in England right now, where the prime minister has just been kicked out, of course, that's what I talk about. I talk about what's going on. And if my dad was on trial and I didn't mention it, it would mean, am I blind? Am I not seeing what's going on? Yes. And also, it was something which was very emotional to me because like Malawians were sending me hate mail, right? And so I talked about the messages I was receiving and, you know, I just talk about whatever is going on. What do you think about the sending of hate mail? We're living in a time whereby people are on social media. Yeah. We hear about people being attacked on social media. What's your take? What do you think? Personally, I just think it's just a hazard of the job. People are on their little computers. They don't see you face to face and then they will send some nonsense. But I think at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. It's a, it's a stranger on the internet. What do I care if he hates me? I'm not saying do it because there are some people who are emotionally affected by it, but I don't care. My friends like me, my family like me. I don't care if you know, some user in the middle of Blantyre who doesn't like my jokes sends me, hey, I hate your jokes. It's, it's a stranger. But some people, they're affected. I know there's some singers like Ed Sheeran who's left social media because he couldn't deal with it. But for me, bring it. Wow. Wow. I know the people who love me, so I don't, I don't need the world to love me. Is that how you want people to respond to such issues? No, I think as a comedian, you can't be 
expected to be invited to the party, right? Because as a comedian, I'm actually quoting Joan Rivers, a famous comedian, when I say that, in that as a comedian, you are making fun of everyone. So if I'm making fun of the owner of the party, he's not going to invite me to the party. So as a comedian, you're making fun of the president. Maybe you won't be invited to the, the next, uh, you know, um, next big presidential event. If I make fun of a musician, maybe he won't invite me to my, his next opening. But at the same time, I'm being funny for the people in the room. So I don't expect everyone to like me. Because a comedian is a bit of a, a rogue, right? It's a, bit, it's a role where you are often the person insulting people to their face. You make jokes about racism. Yes. Right? They, uh, I've also seen that Trevor talks about apartheid. That was a big thing in, 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 in South Africa. Is, is that what people want to hear now? Do you think racism is funny? Because, look, um, at one, of, one of the jokes that you made was saying that uh, uh, if it was uh, some years back, 200 years ago, two years ago, this would have been, been an auction, an auction at the way. At time, I was performing in front of a crowd which was mostly white. Yeah. Right, in English. Yes, yes. And so this is what I think is, comedy has got a power in that you can talk about uncomfortable issues in a way that people will listen, right? And so if I talk about racism to a room of white people or colonialism to a room of white people as a lecture, some of them will walk out. They don't want to listen. But because you're making it funny, you get some points across and you make people think about things. I've had people message me and say, you know, I never thought about it this way. During the Black Lives Matter demonstrations, yes. I did a joke about how all of these people who get angry when people say Black Lives Matter, and they're like, yeah. all lives matter. I'm like, hey, it's like if there are people doing a fundraiser for cancer, and you're like, hey, but what about AIDS? Like, we are focusing on this issue now. Yeah. And people would message me. They laugh, but they would say, I didn't think of it that way it's okay to say Black Lives Matter. These are people who are... And so I think it's like, it's not that I'm trying to educate, I'm trying to make people laugh, but you can, you can get some education across because it's, um, it's, like, it's like putting sh the medicine in sugar. Is it not reverse psychology where you're now saying, look, you guys, you did this to us, now I can tell you in your face? Like, like, it is, like, but yeah, it's... like people, black people said, I can't be racist. Like, the only people that can be racist are white people. No, no, no. Black people can be racist. And I talk about that. I've got a barber who's very racist. He's, he's cutting my hair and he's telling me we must kill the white people. <laughs> <laughs> literally? Ra yeah, he's literally saying, ah, oh, one day we'll, we'll have our revenge. There are people who are racist in all cu cultures. But I talk about it in terms of... If you talk about it, you make people aware of it and they think about it. It's the same thing like I, I've talked about like HIV, right? When you talk about it, it's less of a monster and people can actually engage with it. When it's a thing which you keep quiet and you don't mention, it actually is more of a scary thing. So I think we've got to talk about things which we don't want to talk about, be it corruption, be it um, you know, racism, be it um, rape or misogyny. We've got to talk about these things because then we actually deal with them. And comedy is a comfortable way to start the conversation. I've seen a lot of strong men that are weak in the presence of the women that they love and, uh, you know, they control. Women like to control. I when, don't know when, women like to control. Yeah, but what I'm saying is, when you make a joke, say, about your girlfriend, is it an issue that you, you will take it home and say, no, 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 no more jokes about me now no, because it depends, you're not going to get lucky tonight? It depends on the girlfriend and depends on the joke, right? I had a, a girlfriend who literally... We, practically broke up because of a joke where after because it wasn't about Did her it was about her family and she was like so upset that i i brought them up even though it was i was not lying i was telling the <laughs> truth about what happened but you don't but get then to joke about i your also life. think now when people start dating me they know who i am so the person i'm dating now she likes the jokes because she knows who i am even when they're about her she knows it's my, it's my thing. But it was harder for one before who didn't understand. Let's talk about the shows that you're going to have in Malawi. One in Blanta and one in Dilongo. What should people expect from these shows? They're, it's my big return. So I'm doing Amarillis Hotel, where we yeah. are in Blanta, and I'm doing BICC in Dilongo. And yes. I came earlier this year, but that was almost just testing the waters, seeing how much comedy there was here after the pandemic. Now that I know that, oh, people are coming out, people are ready to come out, this is my big return. 
it's going to be absolutely crazy. I, I've spent hours researching, writing jokes, and I get funny every year. So I think it's like it's a like any job you get more experience. So I think it'll be the funniest show I've done. I have to judge you whether you're get, you're getting funnier every year. How do you know that you're getting funnier I've, every I've, year? I've seen the reaction <laughs> of the crowds. You will come and see. You will come and see. Um, tell me more about Imran Yusuf. So Imran Yusuf is a comedian. He's an UK-based comedian. His family is Indian, but he was born in Kenya. So he's like me, okay. scattered around yeah. all over the place. And we first performed together at an interfaith comedy show because he's a Muslim and he was the Muslim representation. And, and who he are you? really impressed. I'm Baha'i. Okay. So okay. I was the Baha'i. He was the uh, Muslim and yeah. there was a Jewish person and mm. there was a Christian. And we did the show and it was great and he really impressed me. And we became friends ever since and I've really been impressed watching his career. So when I was looking for an act who not only is brilliant, but who is one, they're not super dirty, because I don't think Malawi likes that. Yeah. Two, they speak about issues which Malawians appreciate. I was like, he's a very good match. So that's why I chose him. So super dirty means that, you know, the whole show is F, 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 F. Yes. But there's going to be some dirty. The, there'll be some. Like, the thing which I think is the right amount in Malawi is that there's two or three jokes which are over the line. But you can't have... I don't think necessarily Malawi likes very dirty show. Like what? I, what I usually would do, what I do sometimes is I'll have a special show in a small bar for the people who want the dirty, right? What's so funny about swearing? We find the forbidden funny. If you ask forbidden funny, you call that forbidden funny. Eb, no, we find. I'm saying humans. We okay. find things that are forbidden funny. Yes, if okay. you look at little right. children, yes. the first thing they laugh about is farting and yes. going to the toilet. <laughs> Right? Yeah. Then people grow up, it becomes talking about sex, yeah. talking about religion. Yes. It's things which are forbidden are extra funny because you're not allowed to say it. So yeah. I think there's a level of that. All right. Now, um, as we're getting closer to the end of our show, I want you to make a joke about me. About you? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm putting myself on the spot so here. I w I'm, no, I've got it here. <laughs> so right there, you asked me a question about journalists, right, taking bribes, right? Immediately discounting yourself from being bribed. Don't you know there was probably, I could have had a lot of money waiting for you, but because you brought it up, you discounted yourself. As much as it's good you ask these questions, you are hitting your own opportunities. What exactly are you insinuating? I'm insinuating that if you don't bring up that you are not a fan of bribing, more people will bribe you. So I would rather tell people that you can bribe me so that <laughs> they don't get to bribe me. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. You see now, you want me to go on the national TV and say, guys, you can bribe me so that you don't get to bribe me. Because if I don't, then I know people are going to try and see whether I can be bribed or not. Come on, man. It's a national television. People are watching across the country and are outside the country. Of course. All right. So, Dali, so as we're coming to the close of the program, you may have a word or two that you want yes. to share. So they're the people that are following yes. us. What would you want to say to them? I am so happy to be back in Malawi. No matter where I run around, this is home. I'm doing two shows, but this is the beginning, right? This week, it's Blantyre. Next week, it's Lilongwe. But in six months, I'll be back, and I'll be doing... I'm going to add Mzuzu. I'm going to add Limbe. I'm go I want to do more and more in Malawi, and I hope to see you in the front row. Forgive me for making fun of you. Thank you very much, Daliso. It's been a pleasure. Daliso Chaponda, he is the artist. He has got two shows in Malawi. The first one is Amalelis in Blanta, and the second one is in BICC Lilongwe. And he's been our guest in today's edition of the program, Times Exclusive, the program that is sponsored by Rainbow Pens. Big thank you to uh, David Masea on the camera there, and of course, uh, Lumbani Ambrose. My name is Wonder Msisia. Until next time, God willing, is goodbye.